The title of the lesson today is The Cross. We remember who we've been studying the Bible with. We've been studying the Bible with our, our great friend, Jerry. We met Jerry. We got Jerry to seek God with all of his heart. He's going after it. There's a couple of challenges that came up, but we were able to address those because we used the word of God. We didn't just quote it. We opened our Bible and showed him scriptures so he could have his faith in the word of God. Then we did the, 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 the cranking discipleship study to help him see who's saved and who's lost. He sees that he is lost because he knows he hasn't been made into a disciple. And we solidify that by him saying, I know my parents aren't disciples. I know there are no disciples out there, so he wants to make disciples. Then we did the kingdom study and helped him see one to be a part of the kingdom, which is the church. We then got Jerry into the, the, the light and darkness, sin and repentance. He's done a sin list. He's written in detail down all of his sins. He shared things he's never shared with anyone before. And now before he gets ready to, to, to really take that sin list and see how it really has impacted God, we do the cross. Matthew chapter 26. Of course, this is right at the end of Jesus' life. He's getting ready to die. And the Bible says, I usually pick it up and get a little running start on this one. It says, he tells them in verse 28, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the first drink of the fruits of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew in the father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Wow. It's always awesome to know that in the midst of Jesus getting ready to die, Jesus sang a song. It's sometimes a little bit shocking to think or it throws people but jesus sang it says they sang a hymn and i'm sure if jesus sang we need to sing in his most trying time he was singing songs you know, as a disciple sometimes during your trying times you need to sing a great song the night before he died he was singing verse 31 then jesus told him this very night you will all fall away on account of me see a lot of times people don't realize some people fall away because they, 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 they obviously love the world or Satan's taking them out. Some people fall away because of Jesus, because of the standard that Jesus sets in the word of God. And you help Jerry to understand. Sometimes people don't want to become Christians because of Jesus. It has nothing to do with Satan. They don't want to be like Jesus. He says, this very night you'll all fall away on account of me. Uh, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. I mean, look at the heart of Jesus. He says, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you. Jesus was looking past his suffering, not at his suffering. You know, as a disciple, you always have to tell people, you got to look past the current suffering and see the end and how you will come through the suffering, look past the suffering and look past the challenges of the moment to know that God is sovereign. I mean, that's what we need in the 21st century now going with what's going on. You always have to tell disciples there will be tough days, but you have to be like Jesus. You got to look past the suffering. He says, after I have risen, that means he's died. So we got to look past suffering as Christians. He says, Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. You probably don't want to say those words. <laughs> I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, which is something very current during that time, uh, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I never will disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Peter was brave in the moment. But he failed to be brave from conviction. Now, there are going to be times as a disciple, you're going to be brave in the moment and say what Peter said. But once again, you've got to be devotional, not emotional. He was very, very, very emotional right here. And he failed to believe that God knew him better than he knew himself. You know, one of the problems with society is we think we know ourselves better than the word of God knows us. As a disciple, you got to help people know that the cross, this, this scripture helps people to go, okay, the Bible knows me better than I know myself. And so if the Bible says something about something, I got to go with the Bible. I can't go with my emotions right there. God knows you better than you know your, yourself. Although he was Strong in his emotion, not strong in his devotion. And we know he failed. Verse 36, and Jesus went to his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press, where olives were pressed for their precious olive oil. Jesus is going to be pressed for his precious blood. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and he went with two sons of Zebedee along with him. Remember, Zebedee became a disciple of Matthew. 
uh, Mark chapter one, or 70 sons. Zebedee means my gift. So what his gift was, was his sons. His sons became disciples. Zebedee didn't become disciples, but that's who they are. And it says, and they're not being too, too much of a gift right now because they don't really pray with them, but they, they learn. It says, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Wow. He says he was so sad he wanted to commit suicide. This is Jesus feeling so sad about his sufferings that he didn't want to even go to the cross. He wanted to take a way out through suicide. You know, a lot of people believe suicide is a way out, but suicide, sadly, is the highest form of pride because you ruin the life that God gave you or the life that God could have given to other people through you. And so Jesus struggled with that, but he overcame. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup was a cup of, 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 of judgment. I mean, this was a big deal. You go through the Old Testament, you look at Psalm 75 or eight, verse 8, the cup that he was talking about was the cup of judgment. You look at Isaiah 51, this rep, the cup of judgment. It, it talks about the cup uh, that you have to drink down to the dregs is the cup of judgment. You look at Jeremiah 25, verse 15. So this is a big deal for Jesus to drink the cup. And this is a big deal for us as disciples to drink the cup right there to be disciples. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. You know, you always get sleepy when you're not doing well spiritually, when you're not praying. He says, could you not, could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? Well, right there, it confirms how long we should strive to pray. One hour. He asked Peter, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. Right there, it tells you what stops you from temptation. Your prayer life. I'm struggling with criticism. Are you praying? I'm struggling with bitterness. Are you praying? I'm struggling with lust. Are you praying? He says, watch and pray. See, God can deliver you from evil and deliver you to evil. Right here, he says, watch and pray so you won't fall into temptation. Prayer stops you from being tempted with sin. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he came back and he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he let, he let them, um, so he left them and went away once more and he prayed a third time, saying the same thing. Wow, three-hour prayer from Jesus Christ. Then he returned to his disciples and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. How did Jesus win this battle? He won it in prayer. He won it in prayer. You win the battle in prayer. And there are some battles that won't be won in discipling. There are some battles that won't be done, that won't be uh, won because you just read a bunch of scriptures. There are some battles that won't be won that way. As a disciple, the cross makes us know you can win the battle in prayer. You lose it if you don't. While he was still speaking to Judea, one of the 12 arrived. With them was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the chief of the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once, Jesus said, greetings, Rabbi. Or uh, Jesus said, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, friend, do what you came for. Then the man stepped forward, seized Jesus, arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, check this out, says one of his companions reached for a sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now, once again, very emotional. We know from John chapter 18, verse 7, that this servant that's talked about is Peter. Matthew didn't mention his name, but it's Peter messing up again, being emotional. He's cutting ears off. You know, if you aren't careful as a Christian, you'll cut people's ears off. You know, it's so interesting. He's super, 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 super bold right here, willing to take on an army right there, but he doesn't have the boldness to go to God in prayer. You know, sometimes people are more bold in their own ability than they are bold in God's ability. He's willing to take on an army, but he's not willing to take on, take on an hour of prayer. We got to be a praying people. He said, put your sword back into its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Don't you think I cannot call on my father? Will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Wow, one avenging angel can kill 185,000. How about 12 legions? But how will, then, how will then the scripture be fulfilled that says it must happen this way? Now, what's so powerful about this text is we know that this man who get his ear, gets his ear cut off actually gets healed by Jesus in Luke chapter 22, verse 51. He heals the guy who gets injured. Now, what's, com what's, what's, what's shocking is the man doesn't become a disciple. You know, if God healed you in the midst of you being able to be killed, I mean, Peter was not trying to cut off his ear. He was trying to, how did they kill people? They took the, they took a halberd, H-A-L-B-E-G-E-R. 
boom, and they hit you right in the head, and they split you in half, and they killed you. So literally, Peter lost it, and he was trying to kill the guy. But he moved, and he only got an ear off. The guy gets his ear healed and still doesn't follow God if you look at Luke chapter 22. Some people don't even be convinced even when God does great things in their life. Even when God spares them from death, there are some people that literally won't become disciples. Um, it says, at that time, Jesus, in verse 55, at that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs uh, to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching. That tells you how much you should share. Every day. Every day you should be sharing, posting, Facebook, texting, trying to make a disciple. WhatsApp, TikTok. Talk, the time is ticking. Amen. <laughs> it says, then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Wow. Once again, he's getting ready to die, and now he's alone. As a disciple, there'll be times when you will be alone. You still have to stay faithful. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed at a distance. He's in the courtyard of cowardice. <laughs> Sometimes you'll be like Peter in your Christian walk, following Jesus, but at a distance, which is not a good thing. Right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests of the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus, so that could put him to death. If they look for false evidence in the first century, how about the 21st? Absolutely. But they did not find a way, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Then I priest stood up and said, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. I tell you, by living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. He said, he spoke in blasphemy. We don't need any more witnesses. Look now, you have heard blasphemy. What do you think? He's worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ. Who hit you? Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. There he is, the courtyard of cowardice. And a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I mean, you know you're doing bad spiritually when you don't want to share your faith with the little girl at Tesco. You know you're doing terrible when you get nervous. And sadly, I've been there as a disciple and I'm not close to God. Even the, the, the servant girl at Sainsbury, even uh, the, the, the person that just, just, just individual, you can be, we can be man focused. It says after a little while, verse 73, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you're one of them for your accent gives you away. I can hear him right now. I can hear him if he's in food. He's like, yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Amen. If you, amen. Amen. You know how brothers are. Amen. <laughs> then he began to call curses on himself and he swore, I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus spoken. When did Peter remember the word of God? He remembered after failure, not before. See, as a disciple, that's a problem with Christians. Oftentimes, we remember the word of God after we blow it, after we fail. And that's what Peter did. He remembered after he failed, not before. I want to challenge you. You got to remember the word of God before you fail, not after. He says, for the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. He went outside and he wept bitterly. There's a bitterness when you are not doing the right thing by God. Yet, what sweetens the bitter waters of life? It is the cross. Exodus 15 teaches that when the people came out of Egypt, they were bitter. They drank up the waters. They were bitter, the Bible teaches. But what happened? A foreshadowing of the cross. Moses took a stick, put it in the water, and the Bible says the water became sweet. How do you sweeten life? How do you sweeten the bitter waters of life? How do you sweeten the bitter waters of divorce? How do you sweeten the bitter waters of racism? How do you sweeten the bitter waters of church, of a church that isn't teaching the gospel? How do you sweeten the bitter waters of life? Only by the cross. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priest and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood. Was that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple, left. He went away and he hung himself. Wow. What a frightful man. 
He was too prideful to confess his sins to Jesus and the disciples. He confesses to non-Christians and he killed himself. You know, sadly, you have some people that know they need to come back to church, know they need to come back to the kingdom, or who have sinned in the kingdom so bad, they know it will humiliate and embarrass them, but they'd rather kill themselves spiritually or physically than confess their sin. I mean, that's, that's how dangerous pride is. You can be so stubborn, you take your pride to hell. Suicide is the greatest form of pride. And sadly, there have been so many over the course of even this year. He portrays innocent blood. He kills himself. And what's, what's interesting is God sandwiches both of these, these stories next to each other so that we can know what a godly sorrow is and a worldly sorrow. So you have to teach Jerry there are two ways to be sad about your sin. You can have a godly sorrow where you get cut, you get cut to the heart, you weep, and you change, and you not only cut off ears, you cut hearts with your preaching like Peter did in Acts chapter 2. Or you get a worldly sorrow where you get cut to the heart, seized with remorse, super emotional, you kill yourself, and you fall away from God, you go to hell. Because worldly sorrow brings death, because it is repentance. Can you imagine a guy who was super sad emotionally about abusing young children, but he never stopped abusing young children? So that helps you understand how God feels when you don't get a worldly sorrow like Judas, who had a worldly sorrow and took himself out. You have to teach people the difference in how sadness and what it, what, what, what it really looks like in the eyes of God. Tears alone don't do it. Even the Old Testament says, you flood my altar with tears, but you make no effort to repent. We can't just cry about our sin. we got to let the cross break us of our sin so that we can continue to live broken for his destiny. It says, meanwhile, in verse 11, um, Jesus stood up before the governor and asked the governor, and the, well, I'm sorry, I skipped the verse. It says in verse 9, it says, when they had spoken by Jeremiah, the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 37 cords of price set by him uh, for the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor. The governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it's as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answers. Now, sometimes you don't need to say anything. Your life is your message. When Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? Don't you see all the stuff they write about the London church online? Don't you see? Don't you? Don't you see? But Jesus remained no reply, not even a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. How is, now, was the governor's custom at the feast to release the prisoner chosen by the crowd? At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when a crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one of you do you want me to release? Barabbas or Jesus, who was called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy they had handed Jesus over to them. While Paul was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Brothers, listen to your wife. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Barabbas to have Jesus executed. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate answered. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime is he? You got to understand, first of all, this is totally outside of Pilate's character. Pilate hated Jews. He hated them. You study how Pilate, he killed Jews. I mean, this would be like Hitler going, what should I do? Should I, should, I, should I kill the Jews? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the history says what that man did to Jews, sadly, 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 it's recorded as one of the greatest evils on earth. And this is the heart Pilate had. I mean, he hated Jews, and now he's kind of negotiated. You know, this is outside of his character. When you come outside of your character, the cross will either help you to have Jesus' character or to help you to come outside of your character. He is responding outside of his character. And, you know, sometimes as disciples, we get outside of our character. We got an issue. We need to get back to the cross. Why? It all matters. He says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. He said, it's your responsibility. And we, we know the cross is all of our responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on our own heads and our children. You know, that's exactly what happened. Jesus' blood was on their head and it's still on their children because we're all responsible for his death, burial, and we're fired up about his resurrection. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Then the governor and the soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted a, uh, together a crown of thorns, and of course these thorns are this long, long as nails. 
set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, took a staff, and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took, took off his robe and put it on his clothes. Uh, after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put, his clo- and put, on, put his own clothes on him. That means he was nude. Many believe he was sexually abused. Then they led him away to be crucified. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene, that's Africa, named Simon. And they forced him to carry the cross. You know, some people need a forcefulness on them to become a Christian. Not everybody. Some need the force. Some need the feather. My wife always jokes with me. She goes, I don't want the force. I just need the feather. Just tell me I'm lost. I'll get baptized. <laughs> she, was a, she was a feathery conversion. Not me. I was one who needed the cross forced on me. <laughs> and some people, I don't want to be forced to become a Christian. Well, it's right there in the Bible. Sometimes you need to be forced to become a Christian because otherwise you'll be forced into hell. I mean, which one do you want? You want to be ju- you want to be offended on Judgment Day, or would you like to be offended now? We li- we live in this society. You can't enforce, it, especially here in Europe. Don't force your views on me. Then stop putting pop ups every time I turn on my internet. I don't want to buy the stuff you're selling me. You're forcing your views on me. Stop putting advertising up. Stop forcing your views on me. Stop telling my kids they have to be gay at school. Stop forcing your views. I mean. Don't be a coward. Don't let the world force their views on you without us forcing the cross on people. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. What was this? This was, this was something to numb the pain. Jesus went through the pain, not around it. You know, as a disciple, there are going to be painful moments. You got to go through the pain, not around it. Don't take the gall of, I want to fall away. Don't take the gall of, I want to take a break. That's gall. That's gall. Don't take the gall of sin or drugs to numb out the pain. Jesus didn't do that. Verse 37. Above his head, they placed a written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Verse 41. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross. And we will believe it. He trusts in God. Let him let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I'm the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him heaped insults on him from the sixth hour to the ninth. Darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Elamasavakni, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. You know, Elijah was seen as a man's man. You know, all the art that predicts Jesus as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, effeminate guy, just like this. That is not how Jesus, he was a carpenter, rough hand. He was a man. So, 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 and Elijah was a man. So Jesus was, was associated with a spiritual man's man. He was not an effeminate man. He was a man's man. And says, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus. Offered him something that can numb the pain again. He doesn't take it. The rest, they said, now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, sin gave up his spirit. No. People stole his spirit. No. It says he gave up his spirit. You know, Jesus gave up his spirit. It wasn't taken from him. You know, as a disciple, you don't let anybody take your spirit. Not the devil, not your emotions, no one. You only give it up when you die and go to heaven. But true Christians never die. They just trade places. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two at the top of the bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. The tombs broke open. Bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. Uh, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the whole city and appeared to me. I mean, this is like thriller Michael Jackson right here. It's like people walking around out of the tombs. And everything. You know, it's like, what is going on when a centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened? They were terrified and claimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene. Mary, the mother of James and Hoses, and Mary's and uh, the mother of Zebedee's son. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea. Well, Arimathea was Ramathane. It's where first Samuel was written when Samuel, the young baby, was born in Ramathane, right there with Elkanah and so on and so forth. So that's the exact same place, First Samuel chapter 1, verse 1 through 20. It says, this is where this rich guy was from. It says, named Joseph, who had himself 
become a disciple. It's awesome that rich guys can become Christians. Amen. It says, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Well, Arimathea was a place that was for the more well-to-do. And so this was a guy who actually cut out a tomb for Jesus to be uh, to be to be uh, buried in. And you couldn't have it. They didn't have tombs in Galilee. That was kind of like the hood, <laughs> uh, a lower socioeconomic place. And so you got to have people like this as disciples. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean lawn, placed it in his own tomb. He had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and Mother Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'll rise again. So he gave the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. Well, how secure was it? How about a two-ton rock over a tomb that was on a hill? How in the world do you get a two-ton rock up a hill over a tomb, and yet we still have people that believe that the disciples came and stole the tomb when Peter was a chicken in front of the girl right there? How is he going to go past two Roman guards up a hill with a couple of disciples, move away a rock, steal a body, get away in the middle of the night, and put the rock back and seal it back on up without nobody knowing? It's false teaching. You need to believe in the cross. Verse 1 of chapter 28 says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, first day of the week right there, that's why we have church on Sunday, amen. First day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And then the Bible says, going to the tomb, they rolled back the stone and sat on it. The angel does. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid they sh <laughs> that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, don't be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell, and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have to. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. I mean, I can see the sisters like, ah, oh my God, ah, oh my God, ah, oh my God. I mean, they were afraid and filled with joy. How do you do that? You only can be a sold out sister to do those two emotions at the same time. <laughs> he says he ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped at his feet, and they worshiped. Then Jesus said to them, don't be, afraid. go tell my brothers to go into Galilee. There, they will see me. And of course, we know what he says after this. He tells them in verse 18 through 20, he gives the four alls for all. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, everything I have commanded you. And yet when you go through this, you see the power of the cross. Now, in the study, now is the point where you read the medical account and you read it word by word to help people understand the severity of the torture that happened to Jesus. He was tortured. He was beaten. He was, he was, he, he was scourged. They, they took a flagellum, a, a, a whip with leather cords with uh, rocks and shard and glass and metal objects in it. And they would whip you until the skin came off your back, whip you until the blood, whip you until you couldn't bleed anymore. And that's how he was beaten before he was even put on a cross. And so you read the medical account and then you help help individuals understand that Jesus died for the sins of the entire world. And you ask, who sins? Well, Romans 3 verse 23 tells you all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's nobody who doesn't sin. Everybody sins. So yeah, but they, what about the person who's never known the Bible? Then the Bible teaches you judge by your conscience. And since you never live up to your conscience and do everything your conscience tells you, you sin. So everybody's in desperate need for the bloody sacrifice of Jesus because your conscience won't be able to get you into heaven. You need the blood of Jesus. You need the cross so you can be saved. And so then you read Isaiah 59, verse 1 through 2, which says all sin, not all, uh, not all sin falls short of the glory of God, but Isaiah 59 says, well, let's read it here. Isaiah 59. You got to read that one.
Verse one. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to say, since God can save anybody, he can reach out and get anybody. I don't care if you're in Antarctica. I don't care if you're the, you know, everyone loves to use it. What about the remote village in Africa or in Asia? God can reach anybody. He says, nor is his ear too dull to hear. God hears everyone, but your iniquities have separated you from God. He says, sin has separated you. To sin means to miss the mark, right? Nobody lives a life that's a bullseye. So when we sin, we miss the mark. When we have iniquities, we miss the mark. We separate ourselves from God. And sin says, your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. A lot of people think race can separate you from God. Culture can separate you from God. Ignorance can separate you from God. No, the Bible teaches very clearly, the only thing that separates you from God is your sin. The only thing that separates you from God is your sin. And so at this stage, you have Jerry pull out his sin list. And then you turn over to chapter 53. And you read in chapter 53 one of the prophecies about Jesus Christ. In verse 3, it says this He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. You know, if we were to be like Christ, we have to be familiar with those who suffer. We have to be familiar with those who suffer the, 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 the racism in America. Familiar with those who suffer from 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 feminist uh, uh, attacks or, or, or not feminist attacks, but attacks on 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 women uh, in Nigeria and the female mutilation that's done there. We have to be we have we have to be like Christ. It says, like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and was and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. And that's why you said, Jerry, he was pierced for our transgressions, right? He goes, yeah, our. No, he was pierced for your transgressions, Jerry. See, I've already responded to the cross. I'm a disciple. He was pierced for your sins. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we have been healed. Jerry, I want to I ask you a question here. I want you to imagine that you're on your way to work, got your briefcase, got your important life. You're standing there on the platform and then one of your papers blows onto the platform and it's one of those where you can walk onto the trains and you look left, look right, and you figure, hey, it's right there. So as you grab the papers, your foot gets stuck. You look up, see the train coming. It's bearing down. You, 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 then the other foot gets stuck. You scream, you're like, ah, you ask for help. There's no one on the platform. The plane, the train's bearing down as it gets close. I mean, you just submit. You go, I'm going to die. I can't believe this is how I'm going to die. And right in that moment, you close your eyes and you feel this boom. But it wasn't something that was so painful because you go rolling. And as you go rolling off the tracks, you look up. And as a split second, you see a man look you right in the eye. And as he looks you in the eye, he was the person who pushed you off the track. You just see this. And you hear him yell, ah, ah, and you hear his bones being crushed and dragged on the tracks. Ah, ah, and you hear the last breath. A piercing scream that could be heard for miles. A silence that is deafening because he's died for you. Tears are the least you have in that moment. Your heart is beating through your chest. You are afraid. You are shocked. And weeping, you realize that it was this one man that just saved your life. Now, don't tell me you're going to pick up your briefcase, collect your papers, and go to work. No. You're going to live the rest of your life in eternal gratitude for the man who died in your place. That's what the cross means. And see, Jerry, when we take all your sins, everything that you've done, the porn, the abuse, all of the sins, and we take all of those sins and we put them into a syringe. It would be like taking all the sins of the world 
and putting them into a needle syringe and pressing them into the heart of a little baby who's never sinned. That baby would be overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And yet that's what Jesus did for us. He died on the cross and all your sins put him there. And it's through the forgiveness of sins on the cross that you can be saved. And so everything you did is forgiven at the cross. I love you, and to God be all the glory. That is the cross study.